Representative Thomas Massey, a libertarian from Kentucky, was one of just three members of Congress to vote against a resolution declaring that the U.S. stands fervently behind the Ukrainian people. For his lone stance, Massey was quickly branded a friend to Russia and subjected to a wave of attacks. On March 8th, with Congress set to vote on a massive package of weapons to Ukraine and NATO, I asked Massey about his vote and his stand against the drive for military escalation. Representative Thomas Massey, you've been coming under attack for your one pretty much lone vote, along with two others, on the resolution supporting Ukraine. What, what was the motive behind your vote? <laughs> well, first of all, I support the right of the Ukrainian people to determine their destiny, to have a sovereign country free from invasion. But this bill, I, I feel like, uh, was counter to the purposes of supporting the people of Ukraine. First of all, the bill calls for basically overthrowing the government of Belarus. I mean, why should that be in a resolution supporting the Ukrainian people? Why, why should we expand this conflict to Belarus? Yes, it's true that Russia has come through Belarus, but did they have much say in it? And uh, so that shouldn't have been in the resolution. But probably the most troubling part of this resolution was it called for open ended military assistance. It didn't say only equipment. It didn't say uh, that there wouldn't be a no fly zone. I mean, we can because people who are calling for no fly zone voted for that resolution. I have to assume that resolution would support such a thing the way that it was worded or even boots on the ground, which we should never have there. No fly zone would be a recipe for conventional war. Well, a no fly zone would mean American pilots shooting down Russian uh, pilots in jets. And the next step, I mean, there aren't many escalations above that, but certainly it leads to uh, and if it weren't an American plane, it would be a NATO plane. And now that that country would be the target of Russia, presumably probably a missile launch. That would drag 20 other countries into the conflict, expanding this globally. This is not a global conflict at the time, and we should do everything we can to keep it uh, localized and not become a global crisis. Something like 73 percent of Americans support a no-fly zone. I don't think they understand what it means, the implications, but what is your sense inside that building? Uh, are we edging closer to a conventional conflict with a nuclear armed power in Russia? Well, I hope we're not edging closer, but there's a vote to send more money to uh, Ukraine and to our NATO allies, in fact, to, to finance troops in Eastern Europe. Two things can't simultaneously be true. If we're, the news reports that are coming back would lead you to believe that Russia is getting crushed. They're being devastated by Ukraine and Ukraine alone. It can't be a, a fact that they're that Russia is a paper tiger and they're being destroyed by Ukrainian army and, and National Guard. And at the same time, we need to send billions of dollars more in weapons and troops to NATO to subsidize the defense of socialist countries. I mean, that should be polled. The American people, we should ask the American people, do you think with $30 trillion of debt that, that you should be funding the defense of socialist countries in Europe? You mean like the social de subsidizing the social democracy of Germany or uh, the Western European countries, but the Eastern European countries certainly are not socialist. I mean, this seems to be a geopolitical play. Uh, and, you know, the arms industry obviously is is benefiting. How do the American people benefit from this when oil gas prices are going up in light of the Russian oil ban? Uh, how does how do how does the American working class benefit? Well, there's two kinds of sanctions. There are those that are meaningless. For instance, Netflix on their own has decided to cancel subscription. It's in Russia. It might be a good thing. I don't know. It might be good for the Russians. But, uh, you know, uh, in all honesty, it was their glimpse into the Western world and how capitalism works and, the, and how we live. And so they're shutting that off. They probably shut it off because uh, the credit cards were shut off and they probably weren't getting any money. So there's the virtue, virtue signaling kind of sanctions that Biden and some private companies have undertaken. And then there are the crippling sanctions. OK, but who are they crippling? They're not crippling Putin, per se. He'll find a market for his oil. They're crippling the people. Uh, here in this country, first of all, we're going to see higher prices. The low income people are being pinched the most by inflation. We've got gasoline is about to go to five dollars a gallon at the pump. And that's it's not going to stop there. So, uh, you know, and there are lots of other things we bring from Russia, like fertilizer over a billion dollars. Don't you know, uh, try not putting a billion dollars of fertilizer on the fields in America this year and see what that does to food prices and and supply chain issues. So. 
if you think all of these things through, there's two kinds of sanctions. The sanctions that would cripple Russia, but it would cripple us as well. It's kind of mutually assured sanctions, economic devastation. I mean, some people are saying that this is deliberate. I mean, it's an attack on the part of the American working class that, I mean, a lot of them, like I was just with the trucker convoy. They don't support the Democrats. I mean, do you think there's there are any elements that actually benefit from this? I mean, certainly the no. domestic oil, you know, LNG oil producers are benefiting from the higher prices, the collapse of Nord Stream 2. No, I don't, I don't think <laughs> I don't see any sinister plot from, you know, domestic suppliers of energy. Certainly they're going to benefit from higher prices, but that's the signal that they need to see in order to increase production. And, and when that does, the prices will settle down. I do think that there are people inside of this building who are taking advantage of this crisis. I mean, you can go back and find in interviews, they say they want higher prices of gasoline. They think that will push people into alternate alternative energy, which frankly isn't economical right now. So so it's, I don't know that it's architected, but there's certainly people taking advantage of this crisis. If you read the resolution, the very resolution that I uh, voted against, it's it's got something in there that Republicans thought they were clever that they got in there. It said that we're going to be more energy independent. This is a call to energy independence in America, but it doesn't say how we're going to get there. And it doesn't say that we're going to increase uh, uh, domestic production of oil and gas, which means what that resolution really says is we're going to uh, use this to go use unreliable alternate sources of energy. Which the transportation department has been pushing relentlessly. But what do you think of the um, talking point that Americans need to pay higher gas prices and suffer more inflation as a, the cost of freedom, supporting the supposed freedom of Ukraine? This is what we're hearing from the Biden administration's proxies. Um, well, you know, I don't know how that polls for Joe Biden, but uh, I don't think the American people are buying it. I don't think they're uh, believing it. Yes, he would like to blame the massive inflation and his own domestic energy policies. He'd like to take blame from that and put it on Putin and the war by by establishing that connection. But I don't think people are buying it. Look, we've spent seven trillion dollars in here on covid. We've paid people not to work. We have paid governors to cripple their own economies. And now that those chickens are coming home to roost. And that's that's plus Biden's domestic energy policy. That's what we're seeing. On top of that will be if he does, in fact, sanction Russia, we'll see higher energy prices. But look, there that's going to go into the global supply of oil. Somebody else is going to buy that. It may, in fact, end up here after it changes hands. It's not really going to reduce how much oil that Russia sells, at least not in the medium to long term. Are you able to form any coalition or partnership with the progressives in Congress against escalating this war? Ilhan Omar just came out against, uh, I believe, the Russian oil ban. I would have hoped to get some to vote against that resolution. But we didn't get any. I thought this that the true progressives were against war. And I have formed coalitions with them in the past and opposing the war in Afghanistan, for instance, and getting that to come to an end. I haven't seen it yet. I don't know when we'll see it. Uh, I have seen them become strong supporters of the uh, right to keep and bear arms, though, it's, uh, in Ukraine, at least. So I'm encouraged by that coalition. Yeah, I mean, it, it just politically, uh, there does feel like it does feel like there's a, sort of a shift on the issue of war and peace where you, uh, libertarian on the Republican side, Representative Cawthorn, they're making, strong, in my opinion, stronger anti-war statements than members of the progressive squad who ran on an anti-war ticket. Yeah, I mean, there's... Uh, people can't su see through their partisan lens. Uh, Madison Cawthorn's objection to war is genuine and my objection to war is genuine, but I'm going to admit to you right now, there are some Republicans who uh, object to it solely because it's what Biden wants to do. And um, that's a problem. And there are Republicans who actually want war. I mean, you've seen them call for war. You've seen them call for assassination of Lindsey Graham. Yeah. Not mentioning names, but those are his initials. Uh, uh, calling for assassination, that's insane. Calling for no fly zone, that's uh, not wise. That'll escalate it. So um, if there is a coalition, it's for war and it's on the left and the right, and it's disappointing. We've heard a lot of talk about fascism in the United States. And the, the Canadian truckers were called fascists, but in Ukraine, you have uh, the Azov Battalion. They are a. Literal Nazis. Literal neo-Nazi battalion 
uh, incorporated into the National Guard. They wear the Nazi wolf angle symbol, and they are showing up now with U.S. weapons. NATO has just sent um, end laws made by anti-tank weapons made by uh, the U.K. to these battalions specifically. Is there anything you can do in Congress to stop shipments to neo-Nazi battalions, or is there just... Is, is, is Congress just acting so emotionally that it doesn't care anymore? Um, I, I'm not I'm not informed enough about internal politics and coalitions within Ukraine to say that one group should get arms and another group shouldn't. But if I could send some of my own weapons from my house to Ukrainians and if they could keep them after this war is over so that they could be secure, not just against some foreign invader, but against their own uh, dictators and, and people that have been placed there by other governments, I would do it. Uh, I don't want to send them to the folks that you've mentioned, but. I mean, in Cong in uh, the intelligence committee today, there was discussion about funding an insurgency in Ukraine. Do you have any objections to, to that kind of strategy? Um, I think it becomes dangerous when you fund it because then are you the target at that point? Uh, I have no problem with selling them weapons, selling them defensive weapons. They have a right to self-defense, but the American people shouldn't be conscripted. They're, not only should their kids not be conscripted to put boots on the ground, but their tax dollars shouldn't be conscripted uh, to engage in that war. And by the way, just kind of summing this all up, this, this shouldn't be a custody battle for Ukraine. It shouldn't be whether they're going to be part of the European Union or the Soviet Union. It sh they, sh they have the right, the people of Ukraine have the right to self-determination. And what that means is without undue influence from the West or from Russia. And that's what I would like to see as an outcome here. So what then what is the proper, I mean, you believe in America first. What is the America first position on Ukraine? I mean, if the war's going to, the America first position is if there's going to be a war in Europe, let the Europeans subsidize it. Don't put that on the backs of Americans. We've already got enough inflation, enough supply shortages. Why aren't we making our own antibiotics and our own masks and things instead of buying those from the Chinese and then exporting weapons to Europe? I mean, we need to start the America first position is take care of Americans, start producing what we need here and quit enriching the military industrial complex when we fund wars overseas. Mm -hmm.